Yes. All right, so let's get this going. This is the relationship between science and Christianity, understanding the conflict thesis in late Christians by Helen de Cruz, and that's forthcoming in Global Dialogues in the Philosophy of Religion from Religious Experience to the Afterlife. Cool. <coughs> yeah. So, yeah, I, any comments, feel free to ask along the way. And I'm also, yeah, looking for categories to classify philosophy papers. Like, why is this being published and what should we say about it? So, let me know if you guys have any, any ideas. But here we go. Number one, the conflict between science and religion and academic discussion. How should we conceive of the relation between science and religion? We often think of this as a theoretical question, pondered in the dispassionate halls of academia. However, the way in which we conceptualize this relationship in the public sphere also impacts the working lives of scientists as well as the lived experience of lay people and the concrete decisions they make. Sometimes this has implications for a matter of life and death. Take the relationship between Christianity and vaccine hesit hesitancy in the United States. In 2021, most high-income countries enjoyed a small rebound in life expect expectancy following the COVID-19 pandemic decline in 2020 thanks to vaccination. The United States was an exception. It saw further decline by 0.4 years. In spite of the widespread ability, uh, availability of free COVID-19 vaccines, the U.S. fell behind in its vaccine rates compared to many other industrialized nations. All right, so here's a question for me right here. Um, like, is was this continued drop by 0.4 years due to coronavirus, or is it because we have no health care and people have been generally getting uh, worse off in the last few years, and it was exacerbated by the uh, pandemic, but it may not actually be because of the disease? I don't know. I'm just taking her word for it at this point, but she didn't actually put a... Uh, reference that this drop is specific to the uh coronavirus and not um just the general shitty state of the united states okay a closer look at the data reveals that the drop in 2021 was caused by vaccine hesitancy of mainly non-hispanic white americans okay so there we go um are we sure? All right. I'm not 100% sure, but you're saying it's non-Hispanic white Americans. Sociological research shows that evangelical Christianity strongly correlates with vaccine hesitancy. White evangelical Christians were most vaccine resistant of any religious U.S. group in the U.S. Moreover, they provided highly resistant to pro-vaccine communications, appealing to in-group values or pro-science messaging did not increase their intent to get vaccinated. What's up, Rethius? Hope you're well. How you doing today? Yeah, I'm, I'm getting by. I'm getting by. I'm doing... Times are weird. Everything's weird. Um, yeah. But I hope you're okay. <sighs> I changed my mind about stuff, and then, like, everything seems a little different. Like, when I change my mind, it's, like, sort of global, and then, like, all sorts of things are just slightly different from when they were. I live in a surreal sort of, like, state of existence. <laughs> My aim in this paper is to put the spotlight on the following questions. How do lay Christians understand the relation between science and religion? And what can this tell us about the relationship between science and Christianity in a more academic setting? My focus will be on lay Christianity in the U.S., in particular white evangelicals. I will argue that American lay Christians, as well as American lay people more generally, view the, relation, the relationship between science and religion as one of conflict. <laughs> what did you just do? Valpo. What did Valpo say? You tick you timed out Valpo for uh ten minutes? <laughs> okay. Uh you know, you give someone just a little bit of power and they go uh they go goes to their head. I guess I shouldn't be surprised. <laughs> hey Shane, what's going on? Yeah, this is um this should be interesting. <coughs> Hope you're well. Like uh yeah, I mean everyone here I mean <laughs> Vipers decided to time out Valpo for 10 minutes. I think Vipers is testing their mod wings. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, of course, everyone here should know Shane. I'll give Shane a little shout out. But um, if anything, this will, uh, you know, show up on the uh, YouTube video later. And then maybe someone will click through eventually. But uh, everyone here should know who you are at this point. But everyone should go follow Shane. Shane is a sociologist and historian, uh, teaches in college, and is quite excellent at breaking stuff down so that it, you know, it's like history and sociology is, like, accessible and fun. 
so it's a great stream. Yeah, I see, but uh, <laughs> you see, Vipers, like, the stuff is actually kind of sophisticated. Yeah, you know, like, it is. <laughs> well, that was interesting. Uh, for people who don't know, in Shane's stream the other day, someone was, like, saying that uh, Pinochet was, like, a good guy. Which, for whatever else Pinochet was, he was not a good guy. Maybe he was a strong leader for people that think you need a strong leader, which I think was the uh, chatter's position, that it was good that they had a strong leader. That doesn't make you a good person. And, like, <laughs> yeah, he was a monster, and Shane is, uh, was trying to make that distinction, and the person got very angry and didn't think there was any other way of putting it, um, that, like, somehow he was not a monster. <laughs> which is insane. Yeah. Uh, Pino sucks, but then again, you don't like red wine. Eh, that's fair, Vipers. Uh, you don't have to like everything. <sighs> okay, so, okay, so Shane, just a little background. This is Helen de Cruz. Helen de Cruz is actually uh, she does a lot of interesting stuff. She's kind of does logic. She also is a religious philosopher, uh, I think, at times. So she's writing on the relationship between science and Christianity here for a uh, anthology. So this is, a uh, and this was, uh, Valpo actually requested this. So we'll see. I don't know. I, I usually think Helen de Cruz's stuff, you may not love her stuff. I don't always agree with her, but usually it's well done. So we'll see. Um, by contrast, conflict is a minority view in the academic literature and science religion, where mo most authors defend a harmonious relationship such as independence, dialogue, and integration. This disconnect between the academic literature and public perception should lead us to reflect on the social role of the science and religion debate. In this chapter is structured as follows. Section 2 situates the conflict thesis in the literature on science and religion and examines its historical context. Section 3 looks at the conflict thesis among lay Christians, focusing on recent soci social, psychological, and sociological studies that show a complex, multi-layered picture. On the one hand, Christians do not experience a cognitive conflict between religion and scientific explanations, and frequently combine the two. On the other hand, some Christians, particularly in the United States, have a negative attitude about science, specifically about hot-button topics such as evolutionary biology and climate science. In section 4, I argue that people's attitudes are motivated by two kinds of concerns, epistemic concerns relating to truth and social concerns relating to wanting to belong to a community by aligning one's belief with that community. Uh, history, religion, sociology, geez, where has this paper been my whole life? Evolutionary biology, too. Yeah, well, this is what I mean. Like, Helen de Cruz is a good philosopher, as far, like, as far as I can tell. Like, I'm not, like, completely up on her stuff. But, like, this is someone who is going to write on interesting topics. And I think this is, um, like, forthcoming. So this is new. Or at least it's recent. Like, uh, down here you can see is a 2020 reference. So this is in the last few years. Um, I don't know exactly when this is coming out. Okay. These two kinds of concerns influence how lay white and evangelicals respond to scientific information. I, dis I discuss how political polarization and its alignment with white evangelical Christianity has resulted in the foregrounding of the conflict thesis. I then take the Deweyan stance that scientific literacy is an important good. It helps people to be informed citizens and is a key element for the healthy democratic societies. I supplement this Deweyan proposal with recent insights on epistemic injustice and epistemic rights, notably by Lonnie Watts to show that U.S. white evangelicals are victim of a systematic violation of their epistemic rights. In the final section, I look at broader ramifications for the debate on religion and science. All right, just so, like, this is, like, hitting all the topics. As Shane was mentioning, like, this has a lot of cool stuff. There, uh, um, Helen de Cruz is also hitting the epistemic injustice literature, which is, like, sort of, like, contemporary... Um, feminist and epistemic uh like discussions on things so this is uh this is one of these hitting all the uh right buttons like for uh being popular like a popular uh philosophy paper so i don't know okay two situating the conflict thesis 2.1 conflict independence dialogue and integration you're <laughs> sort of Valpo said she posted it two days ago. I don't know when it, when it went up on Phil Papers. And Shane says you're sort of drill, drooling. Well, all right. <laughs> okay. Yeah, see, I can see why 
like I said, Helen de Cruz, as far as I can tell, I'm not like completely up on this stuff. She seems like she knows what she's doing also in terms of like marketing her work. This is what I mean. Like this stuff is hitting a lot of like the topics that might be interesting nowadays. So yeah, this is uh, I don't know if like the paper is going to follow through on the promise that like she sort of set up, but this is sort of uh, she's hitting all the spots at the moment, uh, the topics. All right. Ian Barber famously argued that there are four ways in which science and religion can relate. Conflict, independence, dialogue, and integration. While there are other classifications and further refinements and modifications to this basic scheme, Barber's scheme still remains highly influential. For this reason, I will situate the conflict thesis by briefly reviewing it. The conflict thesis holds that science and religion are in perpetual and necessary conflict. Jeremy Coyne sees this conflict as epistemological. Faith may be a gift in religion, but in science it's a poison. For faith is in no way is for faith is no way to find truth. John Evans, by contrast, sees the conflict as primarily moral. Religious people oppose what they see as the moral agenda of scientists. The independence model states that science and religion explore separate domains that ask distinct questions. If each remains on its own turf, science and religion can coexist harmoniously. An example is Stephen Jay Gould's Noma, or non-overlapping magisteria, where science works on the domain of facts and religion is concerned with values. Alistair McGrath has de defended a partially over overlapping magisteria, POMA model, where science and religion each draw on several different methodologies and approaches. These methods and approaches have been shaped through historical factors. McGrath uh, favors a pluralistic pro approach to knowing. There is not one single truth, but rather different disciplines can shed light on the same problem. Hence, it is beneficial for scientists and theologians to be in dialogue with each other. McGrath's POMA leads us to a third kind of model, dialogue. Dialogue envisages that although science and religion represent distinct ways of approaching the world, they can still learn from each other through debate and discussion. For example, Wenzel and Vo uh, Van, for, excuse me for how I say your name, Wenzel Van Houston argues that similarities in presuppositions, methods, and concepts make a fruitful and mutually beneficial dialogue between science and religion possible. Finally, the integration model favored by Barber himself and many other many authors influenced by him envisages some form of unification of science and religion in methods such as natural theology, epistemology, and in metaphysical, metaphysical assumptions. For example, Robert John Russell takes the findings of quantum mechanics, in particular Copenhagen interpretation, as the basis for an ontological indeterminism. Using this, he formulates a model of divine action that is non-interventionist. God can directly act in the indeterminacy of the quantum level to in influence or determine the outcome of some events. Um, yeah, as a god of the gaps, I guess, at that point. Like, God can get down at the spot where we can't see. Okay. Even a brief and cursory glance at contemporary work by Christian theologians, scientists, and philosophers of religion show that dialogue and integration are their favored models. <laughs> Viper says, never go full Deepak Chopra. Okay. <laughs> uh, yeah. There's lots of problems with all of these things. Okay, many of the major authors in the field, such as Celia, Dean Drummond, Sarah Coakley, and Peter Harrison, have elaborated on how such dialogue or integration can be achieved. Major collaborative endeavors in science and religion also favor dialogue or integration. For example, the John Templeton Foundation, a major funder in philosophy and theology in the U.S. and globally, often funds projects on the interface of science and religion that emphasize a harmonious relationship. Yet, yeah, a lot of philosophers take their money. Some philosophers have refused their money because it basically... When they give money to the philosophers, they're not jerks about it. They say, yo, go do the philosophy and whatever, but we're giving it to you the, for this project at the edge of, you know, um, uh, philosophy and religion. But, like, other stuff they do just funds for religion, and some philosophers have rejected the John Templeton Foundation money because they don't want to be associated with the religious funding because some of the religious funding is uh, maybe anti-philosophical, you could say. Ugh. <coughs> Yeah. To give a recent example of such a recent project, the Science Engaged Theology Project at St. Andrews University aims to treat puzzles at the intersection of theology and science. The project's lead investigators, Joanne Leidenhag and John Perry, draw on John Wesley's proposal that it is advantageous to incorporate multiple sources to gain theological truths. They regard science as an authentic theological source alongside scripture, tradition, and reason. You know, this is not a new position. Newton thought that the laws of uh, physics were the thoughts of God. Like, the 
theory of gravity that he wrote down, like that the Earth is going around the sun, he thought that was the thoughts of God. Like, I'm not kidding. Like, he was a bit of a religious whack job thinking that the science and math he was doing yeah, oh, I completely agree. It was just an example, but it's older than that. So I just wanted to make it not like this is um, thinking people didn't think um, that science was part of theology. It's very old. They, people thought they were writing down uh, the religious truths. So and if you have any good examples, Shane, please let me know. But I just like the one that was Newton, who was supposed to be this great man of science. It's like, no, 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 no. Newton, thought, Newton was religious, and he thought he was writing down the thoughts of God. He did. That's what it was. Thomas Aquinas? Ah, okay. <sighs> All right, finally consider personal testimonies of working Christian scientists, such as the cell biologist Kenneth Miller and physician geneticist Francis Collins, who argue that there is no conflict whatsoever between their personal faith and the work they do as scientists. In sum, the conflict thesis is a minority view among scientists, philosophers, and theologians who work at the interface of science and religion. The overwhelming consensus is that the conflict thesis is wrong, with the exception of a few dissenting voices such as Gregory Dawes and Hans Maudem. This is a strong, striking contrast with how lay people conceive of the relationship between science and religion, as we will see in section 3. Shane says, but there are older ones that go all the way back to 2nd century stuff like Origin of Alexandria, though he's though he's technically heretical. That's interesting, yeah, see, I don't know the history that far back. Yeah, I mean, I'm not surprised. The concepts, at least in, like, uh, Aristotelian science and, like, you know, uh, ma the math of the ancient Greeks, like, you know, um, Pythagoras and stuff, it was all mixed up with religious thought. So, like, the Pythagoreans were uh, a religious cult, actually, that were, like, mathematically induced cult. And so they were thinking that they were doing some sort of, like, real arcane, like, weird arcane stuff. Okay, Origen was a Neoplatonist. Yeah, so this is the thing. The Platonism really, um, you were thinking you were writing down the forms of, like, the, uh, like, the realm of forms and, like, the concepts out there were in the forms. And so that can really, uh, how you interpret that sort of other world of forms can be a big deal. Valpo says, I do Aquinas argument from motion and intro, so I'll be teaching this just after MLK day. Oh, fun. <laughs> I have not looked at Aquinas since I was an undergrad. I don't know my Aquinas other than I, he annoyed me when I was doing it. <laughs> uh, yeah, Thomas Aquinas. Actually, I think that was one, the, the thing that I remember most was I was defending Aquinas because people were saying, like they were attributing him this terrible argument. I'm like, no, Aquinas wouldn't say anything stupid. Like, this stupid, like, you, you can't be giving people, like, so little charity in the history of philosophy. That's unfair. But, like, that was the uh, best thing I had to say about Aquinas. <laughs> okay. Anywho. The Conflict Thesis in a Christian Context. Two books are commonly cited as the originators of the conflict thesis. John William Draper's History of the Conflict Between Religion and Science, 1874, and Andrew Dixon White's A History of the Warfare of Science with Theology in Christendom, 1897. Both sketch historical overviews of conflict between Christianity and science. However, they are often cited without proper context. Draper and White weren't atheists or fundamentalists. Rather, they were liberal Protestants who hoped to salvage Christianity from what they considered as theological ballast that did not cohere with science. Their work was appropriated by 20th century skeptics and atheists who used their arguments about the incompatibility of traditional theological views with science to argue for secularization. The conflict thesis thus did not grow out of a debate between atheists and believers, but rather out of discussions between co-religionist Christians with differing opinions on what the relationship between science and religion could be. I mean, this is fair. The atheists didn't really have, um, they didn't give a shit for a long time. They've been around forever, and the idea that they were arguing against the Christians and they said anything new is probably unlikely, actually. Um, so the idea that this came out of a more uh, discussion within Christianity in the United States or in some area, that's much more of a, uh, I mean, I guess that's the history here, but this is actually where you're going to get more of an interesting discussion. Vipers asks, is there anything to the fact that the first scientists were religious other than to say that they undeniably had to be reframed for integration into a pre-existing worldview? Um, no, I don't think there is anything to say, actually. Um, 
you had to of course a lot of these people were afraid and they they couldn't say certain things that were dangerous um so they may not have been like full-on like you know zealots of christianity at least in the west i don't know how it is other places but um i don't think there's anything to it there a lot of these people when you see them right and they say stuff if you like read between the lines sometimes you can see that they don't really believe in the like uh, Catholic Church's view of the world and that could get them into a lot of trouble but you know everyone has to come into the world at some everyone comes into the world with like whatever is given to them at the time and so everyone has that pre-existing worldview um so again like even within those limits it's like you can come in and you can be less cr uh, religious even under those circumstances but you're still gonna have the background knowledge yeah exact natural philosopher then but you're still gonna have background knowledge that's gonna be wrapped up with the times of that you're alive shane says the issue here is that our definition of scientist and ancient definition of scientists are not the same no i mean again yeah natural philosopher and you're taking on whatever the society was at the time um so there's going to be a lot of background knowledge that we just ha it is just different now and so the idea that like they were studying the world like aristotle was a uh, biologist he uh cataloged a lot of uh natural life and so it's like well what was his views well i mean his views are like complicated you've got the ancient greek stuff it doesn't make sense to actually put him in like the scientist view that we have now but like he did a lot of the cataloging that we had uh from the ancient days so yeah Okay, doke. The origins of the conflict thesis predate the 19th century. We can find clear roots in the early modern period when European Christian church leaders and theologians experienced an identity crisis. A series of seismic events had shattered the medieval Christian consensus model that combined a strict social division of labor between church, nobility, and peasantry with a Christian Aristotelian worldview. Centuries of inter-Christian religious warfare tore Western Europe apart. This shattered Christianity's authority as a single unified moral and spiritual block. The aftermath of the Great Plague and its resulting social mobility, as well as the democratization of knowledge through the printing press, further undermined the medieval socio-political order of which Christianity was an inextricable part. A host of scientific findings, specifically in geology and paleontology, for example, fossil shark teeth found on mountains, seemed incompatible with the inerrantist readings of the Bible and questioned its authority. This challenge was further enhanced by hermeneutical and historical approaches to scripture itself. Moreover, colonialism and intercontinental trade made Europeans more aware of the wide range of religious beliefs across cultures. These societal and epistemological changes left led to a shift in the concept of religion. For Aquinas and other medieval authors, religion was a theological virtue primarily associated with inner devotion and prayer. In Renaissance philosophy, we see a gradual shift of religion toward an inner disposition, as in Marcillo Ficino, who equated Christian religion with a disposition to live one's life oriented toward truth and goodness. In the 18th and 19th centuries, there was a further shift from religion as an inner disposition and virtue toward something more external that could be studied comparatively, namely a set of beliefs and practices. Only at this point in time could religion be compared to science a term that also gained its current meaning in the 19th century. Science used to mean intellectual virtue in the Middle Ages, but slowly gained the meaning of a set of disciplines concerned with the experimental study of the natural world in the 19th century. Yeah, this is a good point. I completely forgot about this. The, whole, the, the entire word science didn't mean what it meant um, exactly. It was uh, sort of an orientation as opposed to... Uh, yeah, an intellectual virtue, like you were scientists, you were like studying the world, but then it get it turned into the science we have now much later on. Like uh, there was a nice discussion, I forget where it was. They didn't have the word scientist. There was supposed to be like a man of science was the term, and then like eventually people wanted the the term scientist. Also, it was a sort of a feminist uh, point too, because like women could also have these same sets of uh, disciplines to participate. Uh, until the scientific revolution, that's where it was. Oh, there was no scientific method. Yeah. So like this was like when the scientific revolution came about. Thank you, Shane. Then you start to have like this like set of disciplines concerned with experimental study. Before that, it was just talking about what people did with their time. You were a man of letters. You were someone who read books. You were a man of letters. You were a man of science. That's just what you did. But like it didn't actually mean the discipline of science. I don't think until much uh, more recently. 
And the term scientist was kind of generic. And actually, people had to fight for that. The uh, feminists of, of the, back in the day had to fight for the word scientist because they wanted to be uh, recognized as on the same footing as their male colleagues. Yeah. Well, as was much things, science was a pastime for religion, as was a lot of philosophy in Western, uh, in the Western tradition. Viper says, I have a theory for that. Psychologically, God gods are anthropomorphic stand-ins for your relationship to one's host society. Well, I agree that uh, that does take, um, that's definitely a role. I, mean, I guess Shane would know better about this, though. Okay, continuing. But ask more questions. They're cool. These new conceptualizations allowed for church leaders and lay people to compare religion and science as two bodies of ideas which made, at least prima facie, conflicting claims. Within the Anglican Church, two groups, modernists and traditionalists, were concerned with falling church attendance and, fluence in, and influence in the UK. The modernists believed that the tide could be stemmed if Christianity were purged of unnecessary dogmas and if faith was made compatible with science. Traditionalists feared a Christian theology devoid of concepts such as original sin and the fall would not be uh, would not be worth the name. Uh, okay, so Shane says, yeah, it's a whole discussion by itself. It's not just society; it's the environment. Yeah, it's like how do you actually how do people have um, understand their gods? Is yeah, it's a big topic. Okay, for example, take the idea of the fall. In most Christian theological traditions, the fall is the cause of original sin, the tendency of humans to inevitably do wrong. Sin is why we need divine grace and salvation. However, there is no fixed orthodox theological position on what the fall is. Does it require a literal biblical reading of a single human ancestral pair that disobeyed God by eating from the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil? The modern theolo theologian Friedrich uh, Schleiermacher argued against such a picture of the fall in his dogmatic theology, but he did so mainly on theological rather than on empirical grounds. Later modern theologians such as the Anglican Frederick Tennant rejected the fall due to its lack of compatibility with evolutionary theory. Tennant believed that human evolution and deep time made the case for a historical fall untenable. He saw the origin of sin in our evolved animal nature. Sin is a mismatch between our moral nature as human beings and our inherited psychical constitution, which did not make a corresponding adaptive change, no evolutionary progress, to the extent uh, oh, to the extent as our moral faculties. Like other modern theologians, Tennant perceived a conflict between interpretations of religion, concepts, and science, but not between Christian faith and science. Schleiermacher and Tennant were both Christian clerics. They were not people who were bent on destroying Christianity. The conflict thesis was intra-Christian discussion. Yeah, but like I was saying, um... Anyone who knows the history, I mean, of atheism at least, they're going to know that atheists have been saying the same shit forever, the religious have had their stuff forever, and, like, the atheists aren't really saying anything new, so the atheists aren't going to actually do lots of this interpretation of the religion. They're just going to say, no, don't do that. But they're not going to get fine-grained on it quite often. Okay, and anyway, Shane, if I'm saying something dumb, let me know. <laughs> but that's my understanding of the history of a lot of this discussion. It was all intra-religious stuff, not uh, the atheists saying it. Okay, continuing. The conflict thesis was also an important motivator for American fundamentalists who became active in U.S. Protestant churches in the early 20th century. The conflict between fundamentalism and modernism in the U.S. is exemplified in the Scopes Monkey Trial in 1925 and other high-profile court cases on the teaching of creationism versus evolution in public schools, such as uh, Kitzmiller versus Dover. As Bowler has demonstrated, the popular, ugh, the popular imagination surrounding the Scopes trial has obscured its actual history. What's up, Frank, big time? Uh, yeah, yeah we, we haven't gotten very far, Frank. Hope you're doing well. Welcome in. Uh, contrary to what we might now think, there is no evidence that the early fundamentalists were united in taking up a literal interpretation of the Bible in general and of generous Genesis in particular. Indeed, fundamentalists were well aware that many parts of the Bible should be read metaphorically. For example, they did not, and still largely do not, take, literal, take literally such claims as the pillars of the earth, ancient theories on reproduction where only male seed has biologically inheritable material, and the firmament surrounding the earth. Rather, in the early 20th century, their focus was on the perceived bad moral consequences of evolutionary theory. For example, William Jennings Bryan, who defended the fundamentalist position at the Scopes trial, argued that teaching children evolution would be a menace to morality. Shane says, oh, aloha, thank you. Shane says, I'm good, <laughs> thank God. 
<laughs> the paper here is glossing over some stuff and cherry picking some examples, but it's because the author isn't trying to write a dissertation on the topic, just to introduce it. I would love to quibble, but I need to be more chill. The points are mostly valid for the purposes of paper. Yeah, I mean, this is a philosopher going over history at the moment, and uh, so it's going to be uh, light on the historical facts, because again, it, this is a philosophy paper, not a history paper. So, okay, as long as they're getting it you know they're not like doing anyone like completely wrong here I, it's like okay for a philosophy <clears throat> okay only in the 1950s when the term creationism became more common did fundamentalists shift their focal focus to biblical literalism while fundamentalism and evangelical christianity were distinct movements the line is presently blurred due to the influence of fundamentalism within evangelical churches okay so we're finally getting somewhere to like the now in the late 19th, early 20th century, Darwinism was not evolutionary theory as we understand it uh, today. Early adopters of Darwin's theory, such as Thomas Huxley and Ernest Haeckel, saw evolution as a progressive and teleological. Many were proponents of social Darwinism and eugenics, keen on harnessing the tools of evolution for what they perceived as the betterment of society. That's true. This is a good point. It, when... Um, uh, Darwin's theory of evolution came out, they had no idea about the underlying um, scientific basis. It was just sort of like this abstract concept. And so people could read a lot more into it um, back in the day. And only later did we get into the genetics and actually what was going on. And that uh, that sort of grounded the theory. It was kind of very ungrounded at first. Shane says that's one I'm going to have to argue with. There were literal interpretations for a long time before 1950. The point was tried to craft a narrative. Okay, yeah. So right here, she's trying to shift from the uh, talk about the 50s. So, okay, that's a little bit much. Interesting. Viper says, I thought fundamentalist evangelicals were married for political purpose to create a voting block. I'm sure that's part of it. There may be other reasons, though, Vipers. Um, like, yeah. Like, historical reasons, just not a voting block. Um... Yeah, I don't know. I don't know enough about that. All right. Yeah, fine. Okay, so a little bit of a narrative craft up here, Shane is saying. That's all right. Nothing too terrible again. All right. However, a series of disruptive events during the 20th century, especially the economic depression, the rise of fascism and Nazism, and the two world wars dented this idea of, a, of secular progress and hence the prospects of science-inspired modernist theology. In the wake of World War II, neo-Orthodox authors such as C.S. Lewis argued that theologians or lay Christians should not readily buy into the secularist progressivist picture and into modern science. These neo-Orthodox authors were initially not interested in science and weren't looking for an alternative scientific view of creation. Modern theologians on for the, uh, excuse me. Modern theologians, on their part, found it hard to make a connection between Darwinism's postmodern synthesis. At this point, 50s to 70s, evolutionary theory had been stripped of its earlier tele teleology and progressivism. Yeah, and see, this is the thing. Once we got past um, DNA, which was in the late 40s, then it stopped being the sort of uh, overarching metaphysical theories, which teleology is like it's an uh, oriented theory to like some greater good or uh, some scientific like uh, progress. But, like, it became, well, okay, what's going on with the genetics at that point? And then you're talking about statistical anomalies, not, but not necessarily um, having some sort of progressive program to it. Okay. While it is still possible to combine Christian theology and evolution, as the works of authors such as Miller, Dean Drummond exemplifies, it is not as straightforward as it was for earlier authors such as Tennant. Yeah, I mean, people still do this now. It's just, it's getting harder and harder to get, like, the sophisticated theories to line up with, uh, you know, a religious one. Most of the time, as far as I understand what people do, is they keep the religion and the science as separate as possible. And that way you can make them, like you say, to each of their own, which, of course, they were talking about earlier. Uh, as that's one of the other views. But not trying to get everything to match up perfectly, because they're both moving too fast. Like, the science changes, and the religion changes, too. So, or, like, the way people interpret stuff. Okay. In the decades that followed the Scopes trial, the fundamentalist aversion for evolutionary theory broadened out into a more stringent biblical literalism. Fundamentalism in the U.S. did not dwindle away, as the popular imagination holds, but instead rebranded itself. It merged with evangelicalism with a strong focus on conservative values, masculinity, and white nationalism. This mix gained a steady suit of followers among non-denominational white Christians over the next decades up until today. 
The 1960s saw the rise of young Earth and old Earth creationism and later intelligent design as ways to promote the teaching of Christianity in some form in public schools. In order to adopt a young Earth or old Earth creationist view, proponents had to reject many mainstream scientific ideas. As a direct consequence, U.S. Christians, notably in evangelical denominations, became more hostile to mainstream science, as we will explore in the next section. In this short overview, I have provided some context for the conflict thesis and its origins. Though we tend to think of prominent atheists such as Ger Jeremy Coyne, Richard Dawkins, and Sam Harris as exemplars of the conflict thesis, it's our, it originates in a long-standing deep disagreement between different theological factions within churches. Yeah, some context, exactly, Shane. Yeah, it's... Again, um, Helen de Cruz is a philosopher, not a historian. So, this is a... <laughs> <laughs> like I just have to be like I'm sorry but like this is the best a philosopher is gonna do like don't hate us for being like skimming over some stuff it's gonna happen um but yeah maybe not the best but still like I I don't know I hope you find it passable it's like okay I'll take okay <laughs> and I don't mean to defend Helen de Cruz she can defend herself okay how Christian lay people view the relationship between religion and science in their everyday lives, people effortlessly combine religious and scientific explanations. This struck anthropologists such as Edward Evans Pritchard, who studied Azande witchcraft beliefs. Evans Pritchard note, noted that the Azande, who live in Central Africa, were well aware that terminates are the physical cause for the collapse of a wooden house. Nevertheless, they still appeal to supernatural, supernatural explanations, witchcraft, to explain why that particular house collapsed on, at that particular moment when a certain person was within its walls. Cross-cultural anthropological research has since revealed that people in a wide range of cultural settings use both religious and non-religious explanations and combinations of these. They don't see these as conflicting, but as complementary. All right, so I'm already, like, this is starting to worry me right here. Like, what do you mean by religious at this point and non-religious? Because people have superstitions and other things. Are we calling all superstitions religious? Like, oh, that person did something and that's why the house collapsed on them. Now, you can call that superstition religious or are we calling that, like, because there's a big difference between superstitions and, like, formalized religion. So this is already getting me worried just in the use of the term religious here for why something might have happened at any one time. Like, is it karma? That's not exactly religious. It's something else. Like, karma, it could be a religious thing. No, the, the, it's pigeons all the way down. Now, in philosophy, we say it's turtles all the way down. Uh, I don't know where you get those pigeons, but it's turtles in philosophy usually. It's turtles all the way down. Okay. Someone who recovers from advanced cancer might regard this as a miracle and also a direct result of the skill of her... Per oh. Physicians. Okay, that's from Skinner. Okay, yeah. Um, it was uh, Russell, uh, Bertrand Russell. He was giving a, a public talk one day about, like, you know, science and stuff. Uh, B.F. Skinner and a superstitious pigeon. Ah, uh, yes, yeah, all right. The, uh, yeah, the Skinner tests. And uh, he was talking about, like, you know, the origin of the universe or something. And some lady just was like, no, you're wrong. So the, the earth is on top of a turtle. And he goes, okay, well, what's that turtle on? He goes, another turtle, of course. He goes, well, what that turtle goes on? He goes, another turtle. And he goes, it's turtles all the way down. And he was like, oh, well, there we go. We have a uh, theory of the world. It's turtles all the way down. Evans Pritchard, a oh, big deal in anthropology and sociology, super racist. Interesting. Okay. <sighs> yeah. Interesting. Well, we'll see how it's used here. So he was claiming that they thought had a mix of um, religious and non-religious explanation. There's a lot of things in explanation, too, that are not so clear. But whatever. We can see where she goes with this. Well, I'll have to see what she's using this for. Okay. Religious people live in a different world suffused with science. Many of our everyday actions, such as switching on your computers, boarding a plane, and getting a health checkup require some minimal de degree of trust in science. Yet, yeah, this is one of the things. Like, the reason the computer turns on every day whenever you're streaming, and all the streamers will know this, you do not know if streaming is going to happen. Like, it takes a lot of random things to work if streaming is happening. So you might be like, oh god, will it work today? Now, it's all science, all the way down get all these computers and networks working that to make streaming and all the stuff we do possible. But at this very moment, do you know why all of them are working or all of them are not? Not really. And that's kind of where this gets in. It's like this at any one second, there's no reason um, 
an OBS update. What does that mean? Exactly. Like, you want to scare a streamer, you'd be like, there's an OBS update, like a big one. And you'll see, like, terror in their eyes. <laughs> it's like, I update as little as possible because of this. Like, this whole setup here is, um, it's a separate computer. You can see I'm, like, in a storeroom. It's not my main computer. I update as little as possible just for this reason. Um, yeah, so it's like, why does anything in this one instance work? And you can't go to science to ask about that. Science works in, uh, is a general theory about why things work on average or like probably in certain amounts of ranges of good cases. But why something is happening right now, science has more difficulty with. It has to do with initial conditions. But what are the initial conditions? We don't know. So it's like, why did this happen in this one time? Well, what were the initial conditions that led to this exact point? But that's not something we have. So this is like why you can get into like, will I get this hit in baseball? People are praying. Now, can they mechanically hit a baseball? Yes. But do they know if they're going to hit it that time when they need to? No one knows. And it's kind of part of why uh, people get superstitious very easily. Okay. Some research has focused on how scientists perceive their relationship, the relationship between science and religion. Elaine Eklund surveyed scientists in the United States and found that they are less religious than the general population and show a higher att attrition of religion. However, the majority of scientists in her sample think science and religion are compatible. For the lay public at large, surveying attitudes on science and religion has been difficult. Some studies have found a negative relationship where higher trust in science yields lower religiosity and vice versa, but others have found no such effect. A lot depends on how the questions are asked and their overall framing. Moreover, as Jonathan Hill has demonstrated, there's a gap between lay and professional understanding of science and religion. For example, when U.S. participants were asked a single question, namely whether God created humans in their present form, as much as 40% of participants agreed. But when they get a complete list of the young earth creationist package deal, such as Adam and Eve were historical figures who are ancestors of all humanity. The earth was created in six 24 hour periods. Biological evolution is false. The agreement drops to 8%. To make an analogy with political views, though many people identify with political parties, they rarely hold, hold well-defined internally consistent political positions that neatly overlap with those of the party they vote for. In many cases, the elites within political, or lob within political or lobby groups hold more polarized positions than the public. We also see this in the creationist movement. Evangel ev evangelists reject evolutionary theory, but they do not fund creationist organizations. As Huskinson has demonstrated, fewer and bigger organizations, such as Answers in Genesis, are competing for dwindling resources, with average white evangelicals and other religious people in the U.S. preferring to put their charitable donations into helping the poor or people in war-torn areas over funding creationist theme parks and museums. Oh, I always wanted to go to that creationist museum. Uh, I actually saved an advertisement i saw for it once on some website so like i have that file i think somewhere or maybe not but like it was a this thing where there was like you know it was like uh uh dinosaurs stomping around with like people running around them trying to kill them and stuff so it was awesome oh your in-laws tried to convince you of the ark experience in kentucky for years yeah like the, the, someone has like the, what was it the art like noah's ark thing in kentucky wow yeah I mean, I might just go for the novelty. I wouldn't want to, like, go there and uh, cause trouble, though. Like, if you're going with, like, in-laws, I don't know if, like, that that could cause, like, family problems. Like, I wouldn't want to do that. But, like, I, I might just go for the novelty. But, yeah. <sighs> Many religious people do not hold a coherent, detailed view of divine action. I mean, who has a coherent, detailed view about anything, frankly? This allows them to selectively take from science what is useful, its many applications, including air travel, most of medicine, cell phone technology, while rejecting specific hop on issues such as evolutionary theory and climate science. Uh, oh, I'm not spending 130 bucks. If it was like 13 bucks, I might go, but no way, 130 bucks. Yeah, see, at that point, it's a money grab, and that's just depressing. Okay. Yeah, if it was like two bucks, I'd be like, hey, let's go run over there, it'd be fun. But no. <laughs> okay. So, scratch that off the list of things I'm going to do. <sighs> yeah, I do want to go see if I can find... I should find that uh, old advertisement for the Creation Museum. And they built the local city and county out of taxes forever. Yeah, well, that's um, par for the course for uh, a lot of attractions. They're like, oh yeah, it'll be great for everybody else. Just make sure we have no taxes. And then it's not good for anyone. 
except for the owner. <sighs> it's always depressing, that sort of stuff. I mean, here in New York, we gave um, the current governor is like her husband is like friends with like some billionaire and they just gave some like sweetheart deal for some new stadium. It's ridiculous. Okay. It's tied to answers in Genesis. Oh. Uh, yeah, it's all money. So often it goes back to the money. Okay. McFeeders and Zuckerman found that religious believers in the U.S. have lower interest in science and lower knowledge of science as gauged by science questionnaires. The effect remains even when taking away contested items on the surveys, keeping only such items as an electron is smaller than an atom, true or false. Uh, Shane says, your governor also won't sign a right to repair bill because it would piss off business in the state. Shame on your governor for that. I think she uh, she did sign it, but she watered it down terribly. So, um, yeah, she signed it, but like she added in like some crap that like made it not so good. Uh, so, yeah, people are pissed about that. Uh, I saw someone arguing, hey, any progress is better than no progress in this area. But, uh, yeah, it's really depressing because, like, it would have been very good. But, like, then at the last minute, she changed it up so that the gave the companies a way out. And it's bad. Yeah, she's very, um, I don't know. We'll have to see. I want to give her a little bit more time. She's kind of like this media. Uh, no, uh, she didn't do it unilaterally. She New York state politics is, like, the third most corrupt in the country after Chicago. Yeah. Like, I'm not kidding. It's like us, Illinois, and I forget who else is uh, uh, corrupt in terms of like state politics. So like all of this stuff, you can't be particularly surprised in New York because some fuckery happened. And uh, that's just how it is. Uh, she didn't unilaterally. No, I don't think she unilaterally did it, but she got someone to change the bill at the last second. And signed it that way. Okay. In a follow-up study, McFeeders et al. sought to replicate their findings with a more global sample, but findings did not replicate in many other countries, including Sweden, South Africa, and Brazil. You're going to play Terraria? Do you, do you mean when you're done? Uh, thanks for being here, Vipers. Uh, appreciate you uh, modding. Have a good time with Terraria and the folks over there. Similarly, while studies of U.S. participants show a negative correlation between analytic thinking and religiosity, this does not generalize across countries. The perception of conflict between science and religion results in stereotype threat among American Christians. Kimberly Rios and colleagues investigated possible co uh, possible causes for the robust. <laughs> Sorry, I'm just laughing that I complimented uh, Viper's uh, modding. Sorry. <laughs> Kimberly Rios and colleagues investigated possible causes for the robust finding that scientists show lower religious beliefs compared to the general U.S. demographic. They found that a perceived conflict between science and Christianity led to stereotype threat. That is, when Christians are primed to think about their identity, they do worse on science surveys. This effect is particularly strong for Christians who believe that science is incompatible with their faith. Also important is the relationship between political conservatism and white evangelical Christianity. The latter has been a reliable voting block for Republican candidates for many decades. Religious conservatives in the United States distrust science more than the general population, as documented by Gao Shea. In 1974, U.S. conservatives had, relatively speaking, the highest level of trust in science compared to liberals and independents, but this plummeted in the decades that followed, leading to the lowest level in 2012. What is more, conservative conservatism and religi religiosity correlate strongly. Gauchat found that when teasing these two factors apart, church attendance, an excellent measure for religiosity, predicts distrust in science independently from conservatism. Shane says it doesn't help that so many go to private schools that teach crea creationist curricula. Yeah, I mean, it's been, it's like baked in, like from the get-go here. So this is part of it. I mean, the public schooling is underfunded, then they go to private schooling and uh, they get like this sort of uh, creationist teachings. Okay. White evangelical Christians compared to other religious denominations, for example, mainline Protestants, Jews, Muslims, show a lower acceptance of evolutionary theory, climate science, and recently also the science involved in the development of COVID-19 vaccines. The public debate in the U.S. on science and religion has been shaped by evangelical leaders. As Michael Evans points out, the American public debate is currently dominated by a vocal conservative Christian minority, sidelining more moderate voices. Overall, this polarization by prominent voices gives the impression that science and religion are on hostile footing. Uh, Frank Big Time says also by state, a conservative state will have more anti-science curricula. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
the states here set their uh, standards. And then also, one of the fun things is that uh, they certain states buy huge amounts of textbooks, and so the states can force the publishers to add things to textbooks, which makes the textbooks that everyone buy have to be a little different because uh, otherwise they will lose out on these big contracts for uh, some of the big conservative states here. Yeah, that's you know, Texas. Thank you, Shane. <laughs> The problem of scientific literacy among evangelical Christians, a problem of epistemic justice. Okay, now we're finally shifting, it looks like, from the history and sociology stuffs to the um, more the philosophical thingy. One sec. It's dry in here today. Yeah. When lay people decide to trust or reject scientific testimony, such as the efficacy and safety of vaccines or the reality of climate change, they cannot check the veracity of these reports for themselves. Instead, they rely on cues of speaker or message reliability. According to Neil Levy, people are mainly led by epistemic considerations when deciding to trust science. We look for cues of benevolence, is the testifier favorably disposed towards us, and competence, is the testifier knowledgeable about... Yeah, excuse me. Is the testifier knowledgeable about what she's saying? In this view, white evangelicals are unlucky because political polarization has made scientists appear less benevolent toward them. The politis the politicize I can't say this anymore. The polit the politicization of scientific issues and the vocal public discourse mean that they cannot defer to trustworthy sources, mainstream science. So instead, they turn to merchants of doubt, such as climate denialists. Moreover, because of their low trust in scientists, they are also more vulnerable to pseudoscience, as a recent uptake of anti-vax discourse among evangelical indicates. Evangelicals indicates. Other authors disagree with this epistemic picture. They see the conflict not as epistemic, but as moral. In Evans' view, lay Christians in the U.S. think that scientists have a moral agenda that runs counter to Christian conservative values. Okay. So I have argued, as Helen DeCruz has argued, that lay people mediate their acceptance of scientific testimony through both epistemic and non-epistemic factors. What's up, Nintendo Pharmacon? How you doing? I hope you're doing well today. Shane says, just a note on the sociology part. They mentioned church attendance as an indicator of religiosity, and it is. But it's ex extrinsic religiosity. There's no... There is also intrinsic religiosity, and there is evidence and research that is showing that people have been shifting from a balance of extrinsic intrinsic to a more intrinsic as of late. The theory is that it's easier for it's easier to be religious in your head where people can't judge you. Oh yeah. That makes sense like because uh you know, I think there's this sort of nowadays there's a lot of performative stuff out there, you know, with all the media that people have access to. And so the idea that like just going to church is going to do something, I think the younger generations are very sensitive to the performative act aspects of this. And I think we've talked about this. Uh, Shane has mentioned it before that the kids understand the performative uh, very clearly. And so they don't really believe it as much. And so then the shift to intrinsic would make more sense that like how it is, is more important how you are oriented or versus how what you do like going to church <clears throat> yeah okay <sighs> for example people want to be seen as team players and as reasonable dependent collaborators for this reason they'll sometimes defer to what the group says against their better judgment when information is opaque and hard to check for oneself as well as ideologically polarized factors such as belonging to a group can win out over epistemic factors frank says the church attendance might be more than just correlation. Organizing to take over school boards is something easy to do in a church, and atheists don't necessarily have that kind of non-work social situation available. Yeah, that is part of, um, there's a huge thing about, you know, just having a social outlet like a church uh, membership or a group, whatever, that does, that allows for organization and stuff that uh, may not exist otherwise. Reddit, yes. Yeah, it was that a uh, super stock or a super stonk? Yeah, the GMC thing. Just like, I'm not a financial advisor, but take a look at all this stuff. And here's what we can do together if we all are not financial advisors and move in a block, but not as an actual block. But we just all do it at the same time. <laughs> Reddit. <laughs> and to be fair, Reddit can do things like Reddit has done stuff in the past, both very good and very, very bad. Yeah. Um, well, Reddit does count. I mean, as far as organizations of subreddits so for what it's worth 
And so does Twitch for that matter. You've got like everyone's got little communities. Everyone's got their emotes. If you want to like show membership in your, uh, yeah, well, Shane knows this, but yeah, uh, that stuff. But if you want to show membership in your group, like you can have your emotes that will show that you are like participants in that group. And like, so different members of communities will say, Hey, I got that emote. You got that emote. Like we are like having organization, like then you can show in group, um, stuff via emote here. But like, yeah, but that gets all very complicated. Okay. Moreover, lay people who are, per definition, not experts, do not have very clear and well-fleshed out positions on a range of issues, which also explains why their answers on questionnaires will differ depending on the framing of the questions in any given poll. Yeah, just the digital jungle, yeah. Shibboleths, yeah. A respondent who might pick theistic evolution when uh, when available could revert to creationism when presented with a binary choice between creationism and evolution to explain the evolution of species. Because of the wide chasm between lay people and experts, we might think that the lay Christians are inevitably influenced by whoever happens to be the loudest voice in their community. In the U.S., this has... This has led to a lower scientific literacy among white evangelicals. However, the pragmatist philosopher John Dewey... <laughs> Yes, Falpo, thank you. You get to show off all your uh, groups that you're in. <laughs> like, getting, like, Twitch is its own, like, beast. Um, one of the guys I watch somewhat, he also is trying to stream on YouTube. And, like, you go over to YouTube and all the people that are there in, like, his community, it's so funny because they always use the same emotes over and over. And so you can recognize them not only by their name, but by how they post. And then all of a sudden they have no emotes. And it's just like, who are these people? I don't even know who they are anymore without their emotes. It's like, this is how I define these people. Anywho. Okay. However, the pragmatist philosopher John Dewey argued that it is important for people, regardless of their background, to have a reasonable degree of scientific literacy. Dewey defended this position against political commentator uh, Walter Lippmann, who argued that because of the widening chasm in knowledge between experts and the general public, decision making needs to be delegated to elites and technocrats. Yeah, this is what and this is like terrible. Because this is what all the um, tech bros want. They want to be the ones in charge, and they're just techno fascists, in my opinion. But they want they want everyone to defer to the Elon Musks of the world, which just sounds terrible. Okay. By contrast, Dewey thought the general public needs a demo democratic say informed by science, and the only way to accomplish this is by educating the citizenry through accessible journalism, the public education system, and other outreach efforts by scientists. Moreover, Dewey thought the sci that scientific literacy is an important good that allows people to realize their full potential. Because evangelicals have embraced, for historical reasons explained in Cobes, an image of strident masculinity and nationalism. Yeah, so because ev evangelicals have embraced an image of strident ma masculinity and nationalism, it may seem strange to consider them as victims. Think of the images of white Christian families posing with semi automatic rifles in front of their Christmas tree, defending Christmas. Hardly an image of oppression. Nevertheless, the lack of scientific literacy among white evangelicals constitutes a violation of their epistemic rights. Being advantaged in many respects, for example, political representation and economic power, does not preclude disadvantage in others. Uh, De Cruz draws on Lanny Watson's definition of epistemic rights as a complex entitlement that provides justification for the performance and prohibition of actions and omissions concerning epistemic goods, such as forming true beliefs, being guarded from false beliefs, and gaining understanding of how science works. We have these rights by virtue of being epistemic agents. Epistemic rights Epistemic rights violations are a form of epistemic injustice which occurs when someone is wronged, specifically in their capacity as a knower. We need access to epistemic goods to make sound decisions, both in our personal lives, for example, getting vaccinated against deadly diseases, climate-based decisions on transportation choices or dietary choices, and decisions electing representatives and thus indirectly influencing policies that have a large impact on us all. If we suppose, as Levy does, that scientific literacy is partly a matter of epistemic luck, it would, th it would seem that scientifically accurate information is at least partly due to being part of the right demographic, namely being well-educated, well-off, politically progressive, or liberal. This is a problem. People of all political persuasions and demographics have epistemic rights and therefore ought to have access to good scientific information. Yeah, I mean, the whole thing going back to Dewey was Dewey was very, very big on public schooling. He thought everyone needed to learn stuff. Like, and 
I completely agree. That was kind of what Dewey was saying. The general public needs it to be to understand what's going on. And so people who don't know what are going on, basically, even up to like what the average sort of like concept of the day is, they are in a worse position. And so if people have been systematically kept out, like out for, out of understanding stuff for a long time. This is going to be a problem because they're just going to be uh, using an older and not necessarily bad, but it's just going to be a different sort of uh, way of reasoning. And that's going to eventually, you know, like bi uh, bifurcate when certain groups of people are using a different kind of uh, method of reasoning about stuff. And not necessarily a bad one, but it's just different from like what everyone else is using. You're going to get some, um, you're not going to be able to talk across groups. There's going to be, um, what's the word? And I'm losing my mind now. Um, like, uh. Incommensurability is the term in the philosophy of science. The, like the the way people are talking about won't be commensurable between the two groups, and so once you do this, you're gonna be. That's kind of what's gonna happen. Uh, Shane says no one is denying evangelical science from the outside. No, um, but I think her point here is that it's deeper. It's going down to how we actually understand what knowledge is and so no one the fact that no one's denying what evangelicals are up to that's fine but they're the fact that they're not looking at the world in the same way at this point is a problem for everyone all right so continuing one might object that white evangelicals aren't subject to epistemic rights violations because of this sort of information is widely available a wide range of educational websites and program programs give basic facts, for example, about evolution and diseases. However, distrust makes access to these sources difficult. Shane says, right, but it seems that she is claiming that non-evangelicals are doing evangelicals in justice. Oh, no, I don't think that's what she's saying. I, I think she's saying, basically, that, well, maybe that's part of it. Um, but, like, then, like, how much can we force our knowledge on someone else? Now, did we drop off? Maybe have we uh, failed the public in the United States? Yes, we have quite often. But um, I don't know if like uh, the injustice part here is it's very specific. This is actually a term of art in uh, contemporary philosophy. The term of art is basically that epistemic injustice is a failure of people to be able to know something that they should know. Now, is that injustice in terms of like, is it the society's fault? Maybe, but like the overarching concept is that they are somehow lacking. I don't think that it, because it's a term of art and people are, she's just kind of using it. It doesn't say whose fault it is. Like it's just an injustice in general. So, and it's, so I don't, I don't think she's claiming it's non-evangelicals. It's just that there is an injustice that has happened to them. Uh, Shane says allowing them to believe that COVID vaccines change their DNA and have microchips in them is literally the definition of allowing them epistemic agency. Yeah, that's fine. The this is what I mean. It's like this is why I'm trying to like be very fine about this. The epistemic injustice is the failure to have the correct information to reason well, and so epistemic agency is fine. They have that, but they are not. They have not had the right tools to actually reason well in terms of knowledge, and that's the problem. Is that they they haven't uh, they don't have these sorts of understanding of what they need to make a good decision. And the injustice doesn't directly go against the non-evangelicals. Maddie, welcome. What's up? Uh, Maddie says it's more a difference b between denial of access versus acknowledged refusal of access to knowledge and information. Yeah, I think it's sort of like you're allowing them to uh, just avoid certain things. And are you going to force it on them or is the injustice maybe self-inflicted? And so that would be, I think, maybe what's going on here. It's a... Uh, self-inflicted injustice frank says is there agency for someone brainwashed into the choice um well they are the ones doing the brainwashing here so they're like self brainwashing so it does seem like there is some agency um of course if like someone is brainwashed into it then i'd say no but like they're the ones that have done it to themselves in some sense so there would be agency okay yeah. So, however, distrust makes access to these sources difficult. This is a result of an increasing political polarization where the religious right, in concert with conservative politicians, have promoted an anti-science discourse. So, like, yeah, this is a thing. The religious right and conservative politicians have done this. 
Now, they are part of, like, this whole group, but who's got the agency then? That's a good question. As de Cruz has argued, the solutions to low partisan trust in science are to improve scientific literacy at the level of K-12, to to enlist benevolent testifiers, for example, people who self-identify as evangelical Christians and who are supportive of science, and to improve the epistemic landscape by actively countering disinformation and and science denialism. This could bring less hostility toward science and thus temper the conflict view of the the relationship between science and religion. Okay, I mean, just the fact that Helen has argued that these things will work. I don't actually know if they will. People have been arguing for like scientific literacy at K through 12 forever, and clearly that has not done it. Um, now maybe getting people who actually are from the evangelical community to speak well of science might do something. I don't know, but like that's beyond what I know about. All right, why the views of lay people matter? Okay, so wait, is this the end? Oh yeah, this is the end now. All right, so that's it. So let's get through this, and we'll see. maybe we can discuss. So why the views of lay people matter? In this paper, I have shown a striking disconnect between the views of lay people on the one hand and professional philosophers and theolo- theologians who work on the relationship between science and religion on the other. Academics tend to think that science and religion are not in conflict, even if they are not religious themselves. But lay Christians in the U.S. perceive this relationship as one of conflict. It is important to note that this American context cannot be extrapolated globally as the public's view on the relationship between science and religion differ between countries. Shane says, if that was actually what happened, sure, but that's not what would happen even if the whole purpose was to do it. Education in K-12 is too political. Yeah, I I think that on her part, it's like it's a nice thought, but I don't think it's going to work either. I'm with you on that one. Maybe I'm just cynical. Okay. At the same time, U.S. media have a large influence on the rest of the world, and U.S. organizations that promulgate creationist and other anti-scientific ideas are also globally active. American creationist ideas are, are an export product, which is gaining a foothold in several European countries and Asian countries, so, such as South Korea, not only among Christians, but even among, for example, Muslims in Turkey. For this reason, the American context should not be underestimated either due to its global influence. What does this mean concretely for philosophers and theologians who work on the interface between science and religion? Southern Baptists are huge in South Korea. That's fascinating, Shane. I did not know they got over there. But I know that the Koreans are getting more Christian. Um, So, okay. Okay, it means that careful research showing that religion and science are not in conflict, historically, conceptually, metaphysically, epistemically, is valuable work. Many of us... I suspect many readers of this chapter are already doing this, but more can be done to address the disconnect between lay and, ac- lay and academic views more directly, for example, by acquainting lay Christians with the history of science and religion and to improve basic science literacy. Outreach efforts such as Biologos already make an effort, but more can be done because we because benevolent testifiers cannot by themselves compensate for a sullied epistemic landscape. As we have seen, the current general distrust of science by white evangelicals is due to historical reasons and the present media forgiving conservatives Christian voices while sidelining more moderate ones. Since scientific literacy is key for a citizenry to help decide future courses of action with existential threats such as pandemics and especially climate change hanging, climate change hanging over us, we urgently need to improve the epistemic landscape. Okie dokie, what is this paper? This paper, in my opinion, is okay. Um, what it actually is, this is one of these rah, 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 we philosophers need to do more stuff um, to, you know, save the world. <laughs> Shane says, ha, huh, that's why the high school I taught at stopped letting me teach Bible class. I was teaching the history of religion, and they hated that. Yep. People don't actually want you to uh, teach the history. They want to teach what they need you to teach, which is the politics. Frank Big Time says, I do think a support for Christian science positive voices could help, but it's weird to try and convince a non-Christian to support a Christian instead of an atheist science positive voice. Yeah, like this is where you're going to get into the... uh, I I completely agree, Frank. How are you actually going to go about doing this? It's going to be complicated. Um, Very complicated to like get... I mean, granted, if you come to the United States and you're an evangelical area, then you need to get like a, you know, a science positive voice that is with that group like that they can respect. But like in general, um, it's uh, it's very hard. Yeah, you're. 
Shane says, yeah, you have to have someone already inside the system. Yeah. And so, unfortunately, this paper is one of these, like, okay, here's what philosophers can do. And it's just as one of these, uh, yeah, we need to keep at the grindstone as philosophers and keep doing, putting out good work and hopefully things will get better. But I find this just sort of uh, overly optimistic sort of thing. Um, this is what philosophers have been doing for a long time. Maybe if we did more of it, like more philosophy, got public philosophy, more people got out there doing it. But as Shane says, you need people inside the system. You can work with the system. You can do more stuff. But is this really like a big deal here, this paper? No, this is one of these rah, rah, rah papers saying, here's the history. Here's the problem, which uh, comes down to the one paragraph on the epistemic uh, injustice, which um, it was not a whole lot, frankly. It was not a whole lot of this. This is that. So basically, we have this one thing we're trying to c counteract, the epistemic injustice injustice which is saying these we have a whole group of people that are lacking the right um way to think about the way the world is now as we understand it and that is causing them to you know act in a politically controllable way basically and we need to counteract this but that that's the they haven't really offered anything more than they've said before Shane says, I would like to say that this paper has great ideas, and I agree with the point at the end, At the end, but I asked, did DeCruz go and give this as a lecture at Bob Jones University or Liberty, or did she ask to lead a Sunday school class? Maybe so. And yeah, you may have missed the first um, little bit. This is forthcoming in global dialogues in the philosophy of religion, from religious experience to the afterlife, edited by Yujin Nagasawa and Mohammed Saleh Zarapur. So basically, this is an academic book chapter. That's what this is. So I wouldn't actually put it past Helen DeCruz to have to be part of a religious uh, community. I, I wouldn't be surprised at all if she was. I've seen her write on philosophy of religion before on these topics, and I think she actually goes and does some things. So is she taking her own advice? I don't know, but I would suspect maybe she is. But like again like i completely agree with you i agree with this paper more needs to be done but again it was just like it's sort of an outline for the problem and outline historically and philosophically for what the philosophical problem is in contemporary terms it's the epistemic injustice i mean in you know political terms everyone knows we've got a very large voting block that is basically doing whatever they want at this point the evangelicals do what the evangelicals want they do not care about what the rest of us want so it's like well this is what it was you've got you've got conservative christian voices sidelining more moderate ones and that's uh how things have been going for a while um so it's like yeah i completely agree but like this was not like hard hitting it's just yes i agree and what's to be done about this though and have you done it yourself so yeah you, uh, Shane says, I get to exercise a very rare high horse moment. This is pretty much how I try to teach these things. Well, that's nice. I mean, you know, like we were saying earlier, Helen de Cruz is someone, I think me and Valpo, who suggested this paper, think of as, some, uh, as a competent philosopher. So, you know, this is like, you know, you try to do it like this. You try to do good things, but it's not easy. And what do you do about it? Again, like, what do you, uh, what's the praxis here? What, what are you actually getting yourself, uh, what are you actually doing to solve the problem other than writing another, uh, academic paper, which, you know, none of these people who you're trying to reach is going to read. If they were reading the paper, it wouldn't be, uh, they wouldn't be the people that you need to talk to. They'd already be someone in the academic uh, circles. So, yeah, no, this is what, I'm, I'm, I'm happy you're happy that like you know there are philosophers fighting the good fight here and I don't agree with everything Helen DeCruz says either like in other areas I've seen some pro like things I like straight up disagree with but like you know good stuff yeah Valpo says more than competent I expect for me the paper does what it probably needs to do for the book I bet uh, you'd be curious to see what's in the rest of the book yeah you know that's the thing it's probably like as far as like a standalone philosophy paper what I said I think holds as part of a book you may be more right like that it i had it had to fit in and do some work in the book and in that case it's probably you know has it's probably better along the way than i'm giving it credit for maddie says the problem with an internal person fixing these issues is that it's an individual solution to a system systemic problem even internal groups uh, internal group people can be ostracized forced out by trying to fix those issues yeah 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 that's right 
Um, but I mean, if you get enough people, like that's cool. Like then you can do more. And you, sometimes you're forced out. Sometimes, you know, you get, you get yourself a few fans. Who knows? Shane says, but structures are made of people's beliefs and you can't change the structure without changing minds. Yeah, I mean, you're starting with the people. Like, that's the whole point is how are we organizing ourselves and around what? Frank says, I think an individual could make a huge difference. Science has a lot going for it. I think it would be compelling if it was presented to you by a teammate. Yeah, I think that's definitely what needs to happen is that people have to start hearing from those that they trust. And that was said in this paper, of course. Um, I just don't know how. Like, I can't go talk to anybody. I'm like some idiot from New York. I can't talk to any of these people, which is a part of the problem. Like, I can broadcast on Twitch and maybe, maybe one of these videos, like, you know, get on YouTube or whatever. Like, someone might see it and think whatever and, like, you know, learn something. But it's very hard for me from, like, where I am and a lot of academics are to reach out. Like, I am not a teammate of evangelicals. I'm not evangelical. And people ask you all the time while you're teaching in the South. Well, I mean, it's like, that's the thing. When you go where the jobs are, first of all, in academia. And two, sometimes you go where people need to hear the voice. Like, you go to talk to people. I mean, I am doing philosophy on Twitch. I don't know if that's a good idea, but, like, I went to where I thought some people would be. And, uh, <laughs> so, it's like, yeah. And the voice of one crying out in the wilderness. You think it's a great idea this channel makes you smarter? Well, I'm happy that, like, there's people out there that do this. But, I mean, I've I think I've mentioned this before. At the I started broadcasting two days after a uh, pandemic shot down New York. Like, I got laid off two days later. Like, it was literally the weekend. And I think I started broadcasting on Tuesday or Wednesday. Um, like, when the final word came down that New York was closed was on a uh, Sunday. And like I started broadcasting either Tuesday or Wednesday and I, I was literally thinking, what is the dumbest thing that can be done? And because that's usually how I make decisions. And then I was thinking, well, what are the dumb things that people have done in the past, philosophically speaking? And the thought of a Zara, Zarathustra running into the market during the daytime, holding a lamp, yelling, God is dead. Um, that seemed like a very silly thing to do uh, to make a philosophical point. So I was like, well, where where's the market nowadays where is the market i was like youtube is already stupid i was like let me go find the people that are like playing video games because that's kind of the market of what people are doing they're like doing stuff live together at the moment and <laughs> the spike no Garthustra. yes exactly and i'm going to go like do academic philosophy where they're playing video games just to like be the weird dude out there and uh that's kind of how this started so Okay, so that I guess we've said enough. If anyone else has any comments on this, let me know. But other than that, I think we've uh, said our piece on this. It was a good paper, and it probably did the work, as uh, Valpo was mentioning. It probably did all the work it needed to in the context of this being a book chapter and not a standalone article. Yeah, so you dig it. So it was very it, like good for those purposes. I mean, I always find this stuff like overly optimistic, but as a book chapter, they kind of have to be. When you're an academic, you have to kind of believe you're doing um, some like, something important. I mean, you are. Is one of the most positive takes on anything you've seen here? That's uh, yeah. <laughs> there was a. I don't know if you were here last time when I was doing the John Simmons paper. That was very positive too. I was uh, telling people though. Unfortunately, I know John Simmons. I've met him before. We both have like a similar uh, pedigree in philosophy. So I was like, I warn you, this is gonna be one of the few times where I'm gonna be like, nah, this is cool. So, all right. <laughs>